All right. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back again to the C Show. Got your boy Chris here broadcasting from an undisclosed location in Alabama. I've got back here with me again tonight the legendary Lucas Wilder, the most premium expert on the Civil War that I have ever talked to. It's a pleasure to have him back for our bi-weekly show. Uh, we're going to talk about one of our favorite generals for a few minutes, and then we'll get into a battle. Lucas, welcome back, man, and thanks for being on the show. How are you? I am doing just fine, and thank you for having me. I loved your alliteration there of the legendary Lucas Wilder, even though I don't know if I deserve that accolade. I do appreciate the alliteration you put towards it. Uh, your legend precedes yourself. Um, so let's talk about one of my favorite generals. Uh, and we can, um, you know, go from the start or whatever. Uh, uh, General John Bell Hood. Um, and uh, brave man, reckless. Um, uh, uh what, what do you think? I mean, well. I to kind of pre preface this, uh, if anyone is looking for a book on John Bell Hood, Richard McMurray, uh, one of my favorite historians and still the best book I have ever read on the Civil War is one of his. It's called Two Great Rebel Armies, but he also wrote one just about John Bell Hood. Please get it and read that book. It is it's where all my information came from and just a wealth of knowledge. Uh, John Bell Hood, I think to understand the man and what we're about to discuss about the Battle of Franklin, you got to understand his early life. You're going to have to understand where he came from and also who he's learning these military tactics from before the Battle of Franklin. And so just a brief summary of who he was and how he grew up. Um, John Bell Hood was born in Owensville, uh, Owensville, Kentucky. His father was a doctor. His father didn't really want him to be in the military. Um, and it, honestly, the military is not that great of a thing back then. You, you, you did if you went to West Point, you got an engineering degree, which is wonderful to have. Um, but if you're going to be in the military, you're going to be a military engineer and you're not going to make that much money. So a lot of these gentlemen, they would go to West Point, they get their engineering degree and then they leave. The military after so long and go and do uh, private engineering feats uh, in the public sphere. Usually uh, for the railroad, right? Say that again? Usually for the railroads, right? Many times for railroads because the railroads are booming at this point in time. And so, yeah, you get a job with the railroads, but just city uh, cities are popping up and they need engineers to be able to, for, uh, to lay out these uh, cityscapes. And so, John Bell Hood joins the military. His uncle is actually a member of the House of Representatives, and he gets him a spot at West Point. Um, the uh, Hood attends West Point and graduates not high in his class, but he does graduate. Uh, he serves in California and in Texas. Um, he serves under Albert Sidney Johnston and Robert E. Lee. Uh, well, actually, in February of 1861, uh, he will throw his lot in with his adopted state, Texas and he'll join the confederate army he'll be sent to the peninsula in virginia where he will become a cavalry commander for general magruder he'll eventually be commander of uh, one of the texas regiments that go to richmond and he quickly very quickly rises up through the ranks um, he, by the summer of 1862 he'll be a brigade commander and then by august of 62 he'll be a division commander at second manassas so a very quick rise in John Bell Hood's military career, um, he'll, he'll he'll fight all the all the all the major battles of the Eastern Theater, including Antietam and Gettysburg, and he'll also fight at Chickamauga in the Western Theater, losing an arm at Gettysburg and losing a leg at Chickamauga. So it's just kind of a brief summary of John Bell Hood, but he's getting a lot of knowledge from not only his West Point days, but he's also getting a lot of on-the-job training while he's in the Army of Northern Virginia under Robert E. Lee. Sorry, the Texas Brigade they commanded, um, the Confederate, you know, one of the Confederate shock troops. Uh, did they get that by, it's kind of like, you know, coaching their team. Did they become those type of tenacious fighters because they fed off him and he fed off, they fed off each other? Or was they just that tough of men that got assembled? 
Well, the, the men from Texas were a different group of men. Uh, I think even the Civil War soldiers at the time would comment about the Texans and how they were a little bit less civilized, as they would say. Uh, that's not my words. That's kind of their words of saying they're a little bit, a little bit more rough and tumble than most of the, uh, than a lot of the soldiers coming into the Army of Northern Virginia. And so Hood, being with that group of men and being an aggressive commander himself, uh, they fed off one another. That's what made Hood jump up in rank so quickly was because of his tenaciousness, his aggressiveness in battle. And Lee loves an aggressive commander. We see this of him promoting A.P. Hill to Corps Command. A.P. Hill is a very tenacious fighter. Uh, so was Hood. That's why he gets put up to division commander so quickly. Um, Jackson, very tenacious. And so we see this as a reoccurring theme with Robert E. Lee. And so when we, uh, we'll see uh, Hood rise up in that same position, even go further to be able to take hold of Army Command. So did this start with his, when he led the charge at Gaines Mill, of him showing how brave and what a fighter he was? That's where a lot of people recognize his aggressive, his aggressive behavior. So yes, Gaines Mill is kind of that turning point for him to becoming that division commander and then getting thought of to be an army commander for the Army of Tennessee. So uh, uh, as we advance on here, um, at Gettysburg, uh, second day, you know, as aggressive as he was, why why did he not want to um, attack? Most of his reluctance was that how well entrenched the Union forces were. And that will come up again when we talk about Franklin is Hood was very concerned with the high ground that the Union soldiers had as well as the entrenchments there. Plus, many of these soldiers, both Hood and McClaws, their brigades were sent in somewhat piecemeal. Uh, Hood was a little bit more concentrated than McClaws, but Hood was sent his uh, Hood sent his in somewhat piecemeal, and because of that, huge, all those the ground made an played an important role in him not being able to, or him not wanting to make the attack and the reason for the failure. Okay. So, um, you know, Hood performed great, you, you know, throughout up, his, up, up until, you know, um, 64, so to speak. Um, then when he um, got promoted to the command or of the Army of Tennessee, um, was he putting the knife in Johnson's back to get that position? Yes, yes. Um the Confederacy, uh, well, let's step back and discuss what is actually happening with Johnston and the Army of Tennessee in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, the Confederacy did have some industrial centers. We see, we, we commonly think that the South was just a rural a society, and for the most part they were, but they did have some industrial centers, particularly Richmond, Virginia, the Carolina coast, Atlanta, Georgia, and around Nashville, Tennessee had some good industrial output not great but it, it was really good for the south well even in and, alabama had um the uh briar the briar works down there that was producing like mm -hmm. uh, and every three days and the naval a lot of naval ornaments mm -hmm. yeah uh the south uh, gets a bad reputation because we kind of and not a bad reputation a um we think of the South differently because we do have to generalize, especially in textbooks, we do have to generalize because uh, we got a lot of stuff to cover. And so we talk about the rural South versus the industrial North. And absolutely the North was far out, exceeded the industrial output of all the Southern states. But South did have some industry, as you, can, as you said, they had industry in Alabama. Now it might not have compared to those of New York and Boston and all those areas, but they still had it. And one of those being Atlanta, Georgia, that's where they're getting a lot of their ammunition and equipment for the armies. And Johnston is using the Army of Tennessee to defend the Atlanta, the Atlanta industry there. Uh, he fought a strategic withdrawal from Chattanooga down to Atlanta. He just keeps, uh, as William T. Sherman pushes against Johnston, pushing towards Atlanta, Johnston moves, sets up defenses, 
Sherman attacks, he moves, sets up defenses, and Sherman attacks again. Uh, this type of strategy annoyed Hood. Um, he, was yeah, he was used to grand offensives that uh, Lee did. Um, he wrote letters uh, bashing Johnson uh, to the government. Um, finally, uh, Jefferson Davis uh, sends Braxton Bragg to kind of interview the generals and see what the problem was, and they replaced Johnston, uh, partially because of Hood talking bad about Johnston. I think Johnston gets a bad rap, but he was simply trying to keep the army intact rather than trying to destroy it in these huge offensives and these aggressive moves. But uh, Hood was definitely part of that reason, part of the reason that Johnston is replaced. And Hood is chosen as the commander of the Army of Tennessee. Uh, so I got one question for you um, before we go back there. Uh, this Fabian strategy that Johnston was using, um, one is a two-part question. One, as he was falling back, was there not any place that he could have made an attack? And, you know, how far did he continue? Was he just going to fa keep falling back till he reached the coast? He was going to fall back until he got to Atlanta. And once he got to Atlanta, hopefully he had wore down Sherman enough that a possible offensive could have been made. That's that's from what some of the historians that focus on Johnston kind of put forward. Now, we can't read his mind, but that's what it seems like was going to happen, which is a good strategy in all honesty. If you can wear down the enemy enough on these retreats, and that's what Lee was doing to a certain degree, not a great degree, but a certain degree uh, in the Overland campaign, you know, right. make, make Grant attack and wear down the troops and maybe you can launch a big attack later. And so Johnston is doing that. Um, that's actually a really good strategy for the situation the Confederacy was in. Trying to protect that those uh, in that industry in Atlanta was extremely important. Um, and Johnston does get a bad reputation, un, uh, un, not not rightly. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. I, I mean, because I've, I've criticized him a lot for, you know, the Fabian strategy. Uh, but then again, you think, what else, you know, could he have done? <laughs> Uh, you know, I've called him retreating Joe Johnston. And, <laughs> but uh, so um, you mentioned um, Lee liked aggressive commanders. Uh, is it true that when uh, Johnston was replaced by Hood that Lee did not support that, thought it was a bad idea? Now, I'm not aware of what um, uh, Lee was toy what he was say him to the president or anything like that i did i have heard the i've heard it but i've not confirmed it that lee was not in favor of the replacement of johnston and i think it might be because he knows uh, especially with hood he actually knows him very well again superintendent he fought hood fought under lee before the war and during the war and so he might have known that too aggressive of a commander and a very young commander. We have to remember he's just in his mid thirties. Um, he's 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 a young man, and he's get big, he's being given a huge responsibility. Okay, um, so a couple first questions. Uh, right, a couple questions before we get to that. Um, the they put him in charge to attack. Um, so. Is Hood this awful commander uh, that was in over his head, or is he put in an impossible situation that nobody could have succeeded? At that point, no one could have succeeded very well. Um, we will talk about it here in just a moment, but okay. Hood, mm -hmm. Hood's a very capable commander um, as an army commander. To some degree, we, we have to add that caveat. There's some problems with his command, but it's actually really, uh, really remarkable of what he's able to do. And he learned a lot from Robert E. Lee and he learned good stuff from him. Lee had some bad qualities in his command. Uh, I think Hood got those as well, but he also gained a lot of good attributes from Lee. And so when we look at Sherman captures Atlanta at, uh, in the fall of 64. Uh, Hood had to leave. And so Hood will actually move into northern Alabama to resupply his army. 
And so him and Sherman are kind of standoff with Hood being in northern Alabama, Sherman being in northern Georgia. And Hood has three options, uh, three viable options at least. He had many more than that, but three viable options. He can continue to engage Sherman on the march to the sea, try to get around him and hold him off and, and fight a delaying action like Johnston had. Um, he can attack his supply lines, but there's a problem. Sherman's not using supply lines, at least not a great deal of them. He has a small supply line, but he's living off the land on his march to the sea. So Hood can attack the supply lines that are going to Sherman, but that's not going to help out because Sherman is living off the land. He's going to be going towards the sea and he's not turning back. The last option and the one he chooses is to force Sherman to turn back by invading the Union occupied Tennessee, Kentucky, and he even dreams of attacking Ohio, which I th which we can definitely say is <laughs> in a, a very grand dream. Um, and he even dreamed of linking up with Lee in Virginia to tackle Grant. Well, Again, why, these are very grand dreams. If you're going to make that kind of gamble, why not head hell for leather to Virginia and try to relieve Lee? I mean, that would be what I would think. If you're going to make that kind of Hail Mary move, that would what I'd be thinking you was going to go. Well, he wanted to get rid of the Union armies that are – he wanted to get rid of the Union armies that are in Tennessee and Southern Kentucky first. Um, that that's he has he's he's the army commander in the West. There's three Union armies in the West. You've got the Army of the Tennessee, Army of the Cumberland, and the Army of the Ohio. You can't just leave. Right. Um, you've you've got to deal with them in some way, whether that's bloody them enough for you to make moves and force them to move, or you got to stay or you got to stay there and duke it out with them. Well, who actually signed off on this plan? Authorized? Whose plan? Who actually said, "Okay, let's do this. Let's uh, give him South Georgia and let's move north." Is that Ult ultimately, that's the Confederate High Command. Um, okay. Whether we can, for whether we, whether you want to take that all the way to Davis, um, or just the War Department, it is signed off on. Hood's, Hood's supposed to go and uh, try to bring Sherman back into Tennessee, or at least, at the very least, get rid of the Union armies that are in Tennessee and uh, get back Nashville. Maybe you can cause a big enough of a stir that Sherman might turn away, or you might have a nice clear road all the way back to Virginia to link up with Lee. So was this Hood's plan? Was yeah, this, plan? this was Hood's plan. Yeah, th this was his plan to invade Tennessee. Now the other other signed off on it, but this was his plan. So, um, just a little things I want to touch on right quick and uh, get your opinion on. Uh, a lot of people who don't realize that, um, like at Peachtree in Atlanta, uh, that you know Hood. I mean, Hood did use some of Jackson's plans and how close he really came to actually pulling off some wins there. You know, Cheatham attacks when he was supposed to at Peachtree Creek. You've got a different Scenario, a different outcome there. Yeah, we, we've got a lot of ifs with Hood. He's, again, especially at that point, the, the moment you're talking about is when he's just given command. It's his first, and it's his first foray into Army command. And so he's, he's learning on the job at this point. He's learned, he saw what Lee's done. He saw what Johnston's done. And he's going to be doing more of a Lee's type of tactics. And these are a lot of blunt force trauma that he's trying to do against the Union armies. And sadly, that's how he's going to try to deal with it once he gets into Tennessee. All right. So when he took command, because I've heard so many different people with different numbers, how many troops did um, Johnson hand over to him? I think I read Johnson claimed 65,000. Well, we know that when Hood went into Tennessee, um, he's a little over 30,000 men. And okay. so um, now, again, it depends on uh, when I've looked through records and the official records of the Union and Confederate armies, they have aggregate present. They have I mean, they calculate all of them that should be there, uh, which 
could have definitely been over probably 70,000 men should have been there, but you've got the ones that are on leave. You've got men that are wounded. You've got are slightly wounded that are still counted in some of these uh, total numbers. Um, when he fights at Franklin, he's got about 27,000 men with him. Uh, of course, he doesn't have his entire uh, another core that's supposed to come up. So he's uh, Johnston hands over somewhere over 30,000 men to Hood. Uh, when, uh, so when he, he, he 30,000 effectives, but he had these battles. And um, I guess what I'm asking is, should he have had, if, if he only hands over 30,000 men, shouldn't he have had a lot fewer from when he finally moved north after those battles around Atlanta? Correct. Yeah, I, I, I said he had a, he said he had a little over 30,000 men. So um, where your numbers were at 60, I've heard the numbers of closer to 40,000. OK, and so okay. that kind of puts that, that kind of hits us right in the right in the correct number. When we factor in the battles around Atlanta, you've got the men coming back into armies. You got uh, counting the one and counting the ones that leave the army for wounded purposes. And so you've got somewhere around 30,000 men when he goes into Tennessee. All right, so take us from there then. Uh, he starts to move north and goes into, I think, Jacksonville, Alabama was one of his stops. Uh, yeah, his, his his last stop in Alabama, of course, he moves uh, – uh, moves up into the northwest corner of Alabama, and he leaves Florence, Alabama, in November on November 21st, and he starts his invasion of Tennessee on that date. And here's the remarkable thing: he surprises the two Union armies in Tennessee, the Army of the Ohio and the Army of the Cumberland. They did not expect him to move so quickly, and he learns this from Robert E. Lee, who moves very quickly, and also Jackson. Um, who he didn't have, he wasn't fighting directly under during uh, in the East, but he move these rapid movements are a very, very characteristic of Lee and Jackson. And so he moves quickly into Tennessee and Schofield, the Union general commanding the Army of the Ohio, rushed the rush to stop the quick Confederate movements. Uh, Union columns were also being harassed by Forrest cavalry. And so that's slowing down the Union columns to even get to Hood. And Hood's trying to get in between the two U Union armies, the Army of the Ohio, which is uh, near closest to him, and the Army of the Cumberland, which is commanded by George Thomas around Nashville. He's trying to defeat each one individually. Um, this is characteristic of Lee as well. Um, Lee will try to take out sections of the Union army in order to make the odds a little bit better. That's what Hood's doing here. And he's doing a really good job of it so far. He has invaded Tennessee. He's surprised the Union armies. He's forcing them to move. And Schofield is in a race to get to the specific locations, particularly Columbia, Tennessee. And he barely beats Hood to Columbia, Tennessee. They throw up a few breastworks and both sides kind of rest near Columbia, Tennessee. Now there's some small skirmishing that's done, but they're both you know, sitting there looking at each other, waiting on the next move and Hood moves first. Uh, much like the Army of Northern Virginia and Robert E. Lee, he makes a bold move. He sends two corps on a flanking movement around Schofield to cut him off from Nashville. By the night of the 29th of November, uh, Schofield was trapped. He was surrounded, or at least blocked off by the Army of Tennessee. He had one core in front of him, and he's got two corps behind him. Wow. In a, yeah. In a bold move himself, this is the Spring Hill incident. incident. Uh, Schofield marches his men literally through the sleeping army of Tennessee at Spring Hill. Now, there are a little bit of fighting that occurs, but uh, nothing nothing major. And they, they just, and they make it to – go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't interrupt you. Weren't they just uh, you know, a mere few feet away from them as they just walked right past them? <laughs> in, in some instances, they were literally feet away from the Confederate army. Wow. Yes. And by dawn of November 30th, they are in Franklin. They have made a bold move. They marched 12 miles through the night, pitch black night, and got to Franklin on November 30th at dawn. Hood was furious. Um, he blamed, he had had a council of war. He basically blamed everybody but himself, um, which... He was expecting, you know, the Army of Tennessee to move like the Army of Northern Virginia. Um, yeah. th this army, the Army of Tennessee, had been beaten and broken down through this war. 
they had won one tactical victory at Perryville and they had won uh, a victory at Chickamauga. And that's basically it. And so, hey, one question. He, I yeah. Cut you off. Hey, um, because you mentioned his speed, um, and I remember um, there there's a house in Jacksonville, Alabama, which is close to more closer, you know, to the uh, eastern side, and it showed General Hood stayed here this night, and blah blah. blah. How in? I mean, because that was a pretty rapid movement to get there. How 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 long did that take him to go from Atlanta? all the way up to Tennessee, through Alabama, all the way up to Tennessee. I mean, that, that was pretty rapid movement. I mean, how, how much time was it, uh, this, this was he covering a day? Well, he is, um, you have to remember, Atlanta's captured in September. Um, right. and he makes his first movement in November. So he has two months of kind of being in, he, he's, he follows up, um, I wish I had a map here with me, but um, he follows goes north in Georgia for a little ways and then cuts over into northern Alabama. And so this is all taking part, taking, uh, taking place for a, over the course of about two months, him resupplying himself and kind of taking in any more troops. Because remember, he's fought around Atlanta. He's lost a bunch of troops. There's more troops coming to him for this next assault. Okay. Yeah. And so Hood's furious um, and he leaves out for Franklin. And here's the tactical and strategic situation. The Army of the Ohio has dug in around the town of Franklin. Now they're very wow. quick. They're very quick, quickly. They very quickly dug in. Um, the breastworks are thrown up very quickly, um, but they're dug in. Uh, with they've got both of their flanks anchored by the Harpeth River. Uh, Hood could not waste time by attempting to outflank Schofield now. Uh, because of Schof because of Schofield linked up with Thomas at Nashville, the two forces combined would be much too large to expect a victory against, uh, which is kind of, I know it sounds odd because he does the same thing just a little bit later when he goes to Nashville, but uh, humor me for the moment. Um, so the two forces combined are just too much for him to actually expect a victory if they linked up. So he's hopefully going to crush them there. Plus, Schofield's back is to the river. This is a perfect situation. If he can launch a strong enough assault against the Union forces at Franklin, he can throw them into the river and capture the entire army if possible, maybe and partly destroy it. This is a but, big gamble. He can either try to flank, that's going to take time, or he can launch an assault. And so that's kind of the tactical yeah. strategic situation between him and the Union army here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, so, how many men is uh, Schofield got versus Hood? Hood's got. 35. They are they are they are basically evenly matched. Um, okay. If you if you check some of the re more, most recent numbers, particularly with the Battlefield Trust, they've got it listed around twenty seven thousand men apiece. Uh, remember, Hood doesn't have one of his core up, so we'd have a little bit over thirty thousand if the other core had came up. Okay, so Pappas. The, the battle's pretty straightforward. Um, the Union had uh, the Union had placed an advanced line in front of the main breastworks. They put two two brigades out there, one under Lane, one under Conrad, part of Wagner's division. And this actually helps the Confederate Army when they attack. The Army of Tennessee's two corps, Cheatham's and Stewart's, attack in mass. They're having to cross a two mile uh, two mile open terrain. Uh, with ease, they push back the two brigades of Lane and Conrad. That's not much of uh, not much of a big deal to them. Um, once their flanks start to cave in, Lane and Conrad head for the Union Union uh, breastworks, which is perfect. This actually works well for the Confederates because the Union soldiers in the main breastworks, Garden Franklin, don't want to shoot their own men, and so they're holding off any enemy fire, uh, holding off fire on their weapon until their comrades can get into the breastworks. This is leaving a perfect opportunity for those Confederates to charge right into the breastworks. And that's exactly what happens. Because those advanced Union brigades force the, their comrades not to fire, the Confederates are able to break through at, at a couple locations, particularly one around the Carter Cotton Gin. If you go to the Battle of Franklin today, they've done such a great job, the battlefield has, of taking care of it and reclaiming a whole bunch of that area and the carter house is a main focal point of the battlefield and so it's right there at the uh, carter cotton gin which you can go to towards today 
Um, that's where the Confederates broke through. Um, one of the more famous men who broke through was Patrick Claiborne and his men. Elements of about three other division, uh, three other three Confederate divisions break through the Union ranks here uh, at Franklin. Uh, Colonel Emerson Opdock's brigade was held in reserve, and they are the ones who push Claiborne and the rest of the Confederates back out from the Carter Cotton Gym. Um, they get a few other regiments from Kentucky and a, a few other Union regiments along with Opdocks are able to beat back the Confederate breakthrough. After that, the, actually in the darkness, so the Confederates are now pulling back in the darkness. This is allowing them to do so. Uh, there are um, Bates Division on the far extreme left of the Confederate line actually makes another attack. After the, after the original attack has basically uh, has failed, Bates Division makes attack because they've had to march around Winstead Hill. The Confederates held off, atta held off attacking to wait for them, but ultimately they go in without Bates Division and he comes in a little bit later. Um, could it have made a difference if Bates Division would have been there? Uh, probably not. The, the Union had good interior lines and they had good reserves. If another breakthrough would have happened, they would have simply plugged the hole again. So that's a, it's a very straightforward battle um, for the most part, especially trying to explain it on any grand scale. But the Confederates launch about 20,000 men. You know, just to break it down again, they launch about 20,000 men marching across a two mile field to attack entrenched so, uh, Union soldiers. Now, Hood's mentality about this, this is one of the big things I wanted to talk about today, was why did he order that kind of attack? Why in the world would he think that was possible? Well, if we look at the former, the battles he took part in in the Eastern Theater, it's actually a no-brainer for him to do so. And what I mean by that is massive assaults had worked most of the time when he had been a part of them. At Gaines Mill, uh, that huge Confederate assault against the Union lines on the peninsula, they broke through. At Second Manassas, Hood was part of that main thrust that Longstreet uh, used to put Pope out of commission. That well, he was part of it, a massive assault of an entire corps of men or a entire wing of men. Chickamauga, he's with Longstreet again. They bust through the Union ranks again with a massive assaults. Um, it's possible, and he sees that happening over and over again while he's in the Eastern Theater. And this is a perfect situation. He's fought like Lee and Jackson did. He outmaneuvered them. He put their backs against the river. Now all we have to do is drive them into the river. That's it. You're saying to yourself, well, didn't he see Gettysburg? Yes, he did. He absolutely did. But guess what? He had sent uh, most of the attacks he had witnessed, um, particularly on the Confederate right, had been sent in piece, piecemeal and were smaller. Um, Get, uh, Pickett's charge was, um, he was, of course, he wasn't watching that take place that I'm aware of, Pickett's charge, but that didn't factor into his mentality when you watch these huge massive assaults. We're not talking about simply divisions here. We're talking about multiple cores. It's worked. And why wouldn't why wouldn't it have worked at Franklin? And so, you know, that's my argument for why did he order that attack? It's because it's worked in the past and it was either then or never. OK, I got a couple questions for you. Uh, sure. um, uh, when Clyburn broke through uh, momentarily. Is that when he was killed? We don't exactly know when he was killed. We have a few soldiers that are me that mention when he was killed, but uh, the reason we don't know the exact location is because it's getting dark for one thing. So soldiers may have witnessed it. Some say one place, some say another. Right. Also, once Claiborne is killed, his body is moved because when the Confederates find his body the next day, um, his jacket is splayed open, his pocket watch is taken, so he's been robbed, his boots have been taken off, and he's kind of in place there. So we know he wasn't, he didn't die at that location. Uh, he could have been moved around near that location, but he was somewhere, uh, I think if memory serves me, uh, within 50 to 100 yards of the, of the main, of the Union uh, breastworks. Do you believe that um, had the, when Claiborne got killed, that that caused the breakdown of the Confederates being driven back because of 
the morale loss or did the union pile in more soldiers? I think to answer that question, we need to understand what a commander does. And not only does he lead, so he's got to be very brave and in order to, you know, inspire their men to do things. But you also got to be able to, you have to be able to coordinate your men. And we, I think we, we've discussed, I think both times we've, just, we've talked, uh, last two times we've talked, is once a commander goes down, there sends up a chain of command. Now you've got to replace that person who then has to replace another person who then has to replace another person. And so when that central leader of a division goes down and it's not just Claiborne, uh, the Confederacy loses six, Confeder uh, six generals during this assault. When all these men go down, that's when you see a horrible breakdown of coordinated attacks. Um, I wouldn't place it just on Claiborne. We've got to factor in all these generals that are being killed, lack of coordination, and plus once you go basically hand to hand in these breastworks, there's nothing left. There's um, there's really no consistency in the battle lines, and so it's much harder to keep your men in ranks and tell them what to do. They're going on instinct at that point. Okay. Um, I was told that uh, something about the Confederates really didn't have any artillery support in this attack. Uh, they, the Union, they didn't. Um, I think they only had two batteries of artillery, so eight cannons. Um, wow. Uh, Hood didn't uh, again he didn't go in with another he had three corps with him uh, Cheatham and Stewart's were the only ones that uh, took part in the assault uh, he still had another corps and his artillery train was still behind he did not wait for them uh, again would that have made a difference uh, he was he was fighting against time at that point is he going to uh, attack then, or is he going to give Schofield a chance to link up with Thomas? And he decided not to. Okay. Um, the uh, Carter House, is that what you got? That yeah, was the, the Carter House. Yeah, I read that they, that's where they laid the bodies out and the generals. I've read there was over a thousand rounds that hit that house of ammunition or, or, or mini balls. You heard that? Uh, I've heard the rounds of ammunition. Uh, Claiborne and a bunch of other generals were actually moved a little bit, um, not the Carter house, there's actually another house that's uh, near the town of Franklin. Uh, they weren't put it, they weren't, uh, if they were put there, it was only for a short time, the, they were brought to another house. I've read that the um, uh, Hood's generals did not want this attack to take place, um, and Claiborne had made the statement of, let us die like men. Do you feel that um, Hood was so mad that he was trying to punish his army? No, um, Hood was an aggressive commander, but he's not he's not foolish. Um, we see he's very sound and everything. He again, this was a lot of pressure he was under because he was a, he was terrified that Schofield and Thomas may link up. Now, you I think the better way to describe Hood as being um, mad or wanting to punish anybody it would be more of Nashville, but I still I don't think that can be attributed to Hood of being angry, and that's the reason he launches assault. And we can discuss Nashville you know, at another date, but no, this was, this was purely strategic in his mind, and when you look at the history of these battles that he had, been fought, he had fought in, it should have worked in his mind. It should have worked. He truly believed that this would have worked. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, yeah, it, it would have worked fine. And I've often thought about this right here, too. You know, when you have uh, General Hood standing in front of you, who his arm is useless and is amputated from the you know, hip down, and he's saying, we're going to attack. How, how could you look at this man and say no, who is, uh, you can't question his bravery <laughs> and he's given up? How, how do you say no, we're not doing this? Yeah, and you've got... <laughs> You've got these generals who tell him they don't like this situation. And again, I, I know I'm keep on harping on this, but I don't think it can be understated that, or shouldn't be understated that Hood's de he's he has launched these massive assaults before, and man, is he confident that it would work? And 
again, he's fighting against time. Even Forrest says, let me go and take some infantry and flank them. Um, and Hood doesn't want to give up the men to do the flanking when he needs them to make the assault. That's what he's concerned about. Now, here's the question that historians debate um, all the time. Um, you know, the injuries that Hood suffers, uh, Hood suffered, that's obviously going to affect somebody psychologically. Um, was Hood messed up on drugs and out of his mind when he was making this, or do you feel like that he was making sound decisions and in full mental c- capability? If he was on medication from being in pain, which he did get uh, addicted to morphine, at least one, at least part, at some point in his life, um, it does not look like that's the situation here. When we see him perform these great tactical maneuvers and strategic maneuvers of him outflanking Schofield and moving so quickly, um, that's not a man out of his mind or a man inhibited in any way. And I'd read that he was riding on his horse 20 miles a day. So, uh, you know, somebody who he may have been in pain, but he was able to, uh, it wasn't affecting him that bad. Um, yeah, a- absolutely. And we know that m- when men lose legs and they have a fake leg, especially in this period when we don't have the prosthetics that we do now, it hurts to move. And we see that with uh, General Yule when he loses his leg. Um, he's uh, in constant pain. And so Hood is well. He's he's in constant pain, especially with the and his uh, legs actually made out of cork. Um, his cork leg uh, it causes him pain. He is in pain a lot of this time. Could this could that be a reason? It's a possibility. Um, he was just you know if you're in pain, you don't want to be hearing from other people that your opinions are wrong. So that could be part of it. Again, we're trying to psychoanalyze, but I do like doing that. It's 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 fun to hi- hypothesize what may or could have happened. Because it's, it's not even the you know the, the drugs, you know, or one thing. I'm thinking about the psychology of a man who's you know lost, you know, he's a, not a half a man. You know, there's got to be something that affects you psychologically at that point. So I'm thinking, hey, is he trying to prove that he still has it, or is? But then again, it's just it's just his natural instinct to go into attack. And uh, and like you said, he, he had him where he wanted him. You know, if it could have been carried out right he might have could have pushed him in the river mm-hmm. yeah so, and, that, and that's what he was that's what he was banking on so do you believe that general hood um uh general, general hood, because people i've heard people say the, the peter principle and stuff like that and i don't and i you know and i used to think that but now after i've looked back and started studying i just look at it as no he was not promoted above his level of competence he was just put in a situation that was impossible for anybody to succeed in. And they wanted him to go on the attack and he went on the attack. Um, I think you're so completely I, right. Um, I, I can't really, disagree with anything you just said. So I don't really see him as the complete abysmal failure as people have made him out to be. No, I don't either. Um, it's kind of cliche that people keep saying he was a great brigade and division commander but couldn't take care of an army um i don't think that's the case um he's put in a tough situation he performs very well as an army commander when he's moving into tennessee no problems there other than the spring hill incident um which that that was a bunch of different failures but um which he was partially to blame for but He's confident enough to lead an army. Uh, I don't. He might not have been the best choice, but he definitely wasn't the worst choice. Um, if yeah, I, I heard that. Cause I, I, I just I think he's got a bad rabbit. I wish history would reevaluate that. I mean, I, I just think he was just put in an impossible situation. And if it had been Lee or Grant or whoever else, they couldn't have done it. Uh, if you were Jefferson Davis um, and you were going to make that change, what general do you think you would have made? To take over for Johnston. I, do I have to replace Johnston? I probably would have kept him in there. Um, probably would have okay. kept Johnston as commander. Um, he okay. was the one that he was the one that was going to keep the army together and stall Sherman as long as possible. And so I probably would have kept Johnston in there. 
I really don't know of anyone that I would have trusted in the Army of Tennessee to have led an entire army. And people will automatically say, well, what about Patrick Claiborne? He wasn't tested. I mean, he had been division commander, but he hadn't, I mean, he wasn't, he had never, I, I, I've never seen a great example of him operating, except maybe at Ringgold Gap, um, operating on his own, a, a, on an offensive you know, yeah. being able to command and make his own decisions. He's been told what to do. Uh, and that's important to understand about um, Army command is you need to be able to communicate well. And I just don't think there's enough evidence for me to say that he should have been put there. Could he possibly? Possibly. But I don't think there's enough evidence to say he would have been a great commander. Um, um, and I, I would never put Cheatham up there. I, I think Cheatham had a lot of had a lot of problems as commander, and Cheatham's not one I would put in put as commander. Maybe, maybe Stephen D. Lee. Um, he was one of the core commanders in the Army of Tennessee. Uh, he might have been pretty well, pretty good. He had fought in the Eastern Theater and in the West. Possibly him, but. Even then, I don't think, again, we don't have enough information to know how well of a commander he would have been of an entire army. Um, that's, uh, that's I, you know, I never even thought of him. That's a great, uh, uh, I'll have to think on that one. So, um, I probably want to get to do, so, uh, Captain Johnston, um, well, I'll just save that one for another because we'll go back to him because I'd like to ask more questions about, about that. Um, do you think that, I mean, looking back, obviously it was the it didn't work out. Um, did the Confederacy have to try to make this hail mary move, or should they have just continued to just fall back and fall back and fall back? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, put it this way: if Hood would have succeeded at Franklin and drove Schofield into the river, we'd have been saying something, saying. Why didn't anybody else do that? Why didn't Why didn't Johnston think that? But it didn't happen, and so I think the best course of action would have been keep falling back, holding hold them off as long as possible. Um, but it, I thought we discussed this before. By '64, the war was pretty much over. The Confederacy yeah. had no possibility of winning, um, other than a, an election victory that may have put a person in the United States presidency that would have ended it. But even then, it was too far gone for any president to have uh, tried to end the war at that point. You know, like I've, uh, that's one of the things that I keep uh, the, the harp on people about this. Uh, you know, Lincoln loses the election. And I point out to him, I said, you know, McClellan never said he was going to end the war. He said he was going to prosecute it better. Um, you know, the Democratic plank called for that. I said, and, you know, you got to think about this. I said, had McClellan won, um, he, you know, Lincoln wouldn't have left office until March 5th. By that time, you know, 90-something percent of the Confederacy was under Union control. Um, Little Mac would have been in full military uniform on the first train to Petersburg after taking the inauguration to take field command. <laughs> He might have and uh, be the, one of the only two times that a president has led troops in battle while being president. Washington? Uh, Washington was the first and only. And yep. that was the uh, Whiskey Rebellion, was that? Yep, that was the Whiskey Rebellion. He formed up about 13,000 militiamen and marched them to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. And when they saw George Washington, I'm kind of simplifying it, but when they saw George Washington, they basically took off. They're like, well, we ain't doing this. <laughs> and you can have the taxes. Uh, but yeah, the, George Washington is the only president to lead armies into battle while being president. So uh, in your opinion, um, General Hood, tragic figure? Yeah, absolutely. Very tragic, especially uh, later in life. Because he's still a young man when he passes away, um, comparatively. You know, and he, he dies of yellow fever in New Orleans. So, yeah, absolutely a tragic, tragic figure. Uh, put in a horrible situation and a kind of a hopeless point of the war. Although um, there there is a historian, um, Dr. Clampett, uh, who... Uh, says that until Franklin, the Confederacy was still hopeful that the war could be won. That's not saying it would have, but the people were hopeful, and that's saying a little bit of something. But after Franklin was when that hope faded away. And so that makes even the story of 
John Bell Hood, even more tragic that he uh, was responsible for bringing an end to the Confederacy. Well, if you had an, uh, been Jefferson Davis and you authorized this, um, would you we're going to go north? Would you go to Tennessee, or would you try to come behind on, on Grant? Using what army? Hood's army. Hood's army. Hmm. That's a good question too. Um, I'd still have something. You'd have to have some army in the West. Um, you couldn't come up to Grant and leave the entire rest of the Confederacy because if you if you left all the Confederacy open in the Western theater, even though you're putting a minimal resistance, at least it's some kind of resistance because it's when you leave is that the other Union armies can also come to Grant's help. So it's actually better to keep them separate than to let them form back together. OK, that's that's fair enough. Um, anything else that you'd like to add on General Hood that you think people should know or about the Battle of Franklin or or, or, or let me ask you, sorry, how close how close did Hood come to winning Franklin? It depends on which historian you ask, but the majority of them, the consensus is uh, he, he didn't come that close. Um, the breakthrough was amazing, but because of the reserves that the Union forces had, it, it wasn't going to it wasn't going to pan out for the Confederacy on that. And one thing I do that I want to say about Hood or Franklin, if anyone gets the chance, go and visit the Battle of Franklin site. The the people there that are put that are saving the Franklin battlefield are doing a tremendous job. Um, I actually started a GoFundMe that all the proceeds went to the Battle of Franklin. I think it's still up. If anyone wants to add any money to that, uh, I contributed twenty five uh, twenty five dollars, I think, to it. And so give them as much to them because what they took out two pizza restaurants that were sitting on the battlefield. I've read about and, that. And so, I mean, they're doing such tremendous work. So please, if you can, donate to the Battle of Franklin and help them out. Uh, they would greatly appreciate it. I would greatly appreciate it to save these Western battlefields. that They, they don't get enough attention. Uh, and uh, one question um, I forgot to ask. I know about the, you know, the day the generals died. Uh, how, you know, Hood, 30,000 men or whatever. How many casualties did he su suffer at um, Franklin? Oh, off the top of my head, I'm not not exactly sure. Um, no, no, no worries. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I mean it's 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 significant, and not only does he lose um, lose the men at Franklin, but then just a short time later, yeah, he goes right into uh, the Battle of Nashville, and it's uh, it doesn't completely destroy the Army of Tennessee. It's still able to reform, but it's not anywhere anywhere. Yeah. And a fighting force that would have been significant. Yeah, well, it, to me, this also shows the um, uh, intestinal fortitude of the survivors that was left. You know, 12, 13,000 men retreating to Mississippi, and the the ability they had to reform the remnants of this and get them to North Carolina to reform uh, the remnants of that. <laughs> force again that 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 was amazing to me it is uh, that they were able to actually cobble together the what's left of the army of tennessee is amazing in my mind um and that kind of helps with uh helps put joseph e johnston in a better light um that he was able to do something along those lines um but um i just looked it up on the um, uh, american battlefield trust and uh, the exact casualties they had is a little over 6,000 casualties um, for the Confederacy and a little over 2,000 for the Union. And both of them going in with about 27,000 men, that's a significant number when you uh, when you do it, when you think of 6,000 out of 27,000 for the Confederacy. Um, that's in, uh, they've got listed here about 1,700 killed and just within a short amount of time. That for you, um, you know, I know we've went uh, better hour, but uh, you know, uh, Davis and Johnson were not best friends. Um, uh, I think J Johnson was pretty good. Why do you think um, 
He didn't put his buddy Bragg back in charge. And no one liked Bragg. <laughs> he, had, <laughs> he had he had too many enemies in the Army of Tennessee, and it was better to keep him clo- uh, keep him in wa- uh, in Richmond rather than uh, put him back out in the field. I think uh, he was a corps commander um, in the Army of the, uh, when they reformed him, or he was a division commander. He went back. Uh, he went back into field command, but I'm not sure what position he held once he went back in. I don't know if it was corps, or it could have been division, but I think he was up under that um, some position. Um, anyway, looks that's all I have for you, man. Is there anything else you'd like to know, um, or anything else you'd like to add for this? Because you know, man, I was flown by, and I know you're busy, and um, I don't want to keep you. And uh, I love these. Uh, but is there anything that you'd like to add to this? Um, no, I mean, I've I've thoroughly enjoyed breaking down the um, Battle of Franklin and uh, willing to do this again, another, another breakdown. Um, you know, uh, I was going to ask you, um, to, you know, I was reading something the other day. Um, I just going to the different theaters and I was, you know, we always know about the Trans-Mississippi. I, didn't, I don't know how familiar you are with battles in that or those are things you can talk about. Um, and then I also seen something about the uh, Pacific Coast Theater in the Sun Belt Theater. So I didn't know if those were topics you were knowledgeable about that you would want to discuss, or you know, we can always just keep it just with the Eastern and Western theaters. We'll keep it with the Western Eastern theaters. I know a little bit about it, a little bit more than the average bear, but not not much about the. Um, Trans Mississippi Theater or the Pacific Coast Theater. Um, I do know a little bit about the New Mexico campaigns, but um, but not a great deal. Mostly about the, mostly about the environmental problems that both armies had when they tried to do uh, when involved in the New Mexico campaign. Well, maybe that could be a good one right there. Uh, we'll talk about that one. But um, man, uh, it's been great to have you on again. Um, Thank you very much, and we'll talk soon. That sounds great. We'll talk again. Thanks.